Here's our message for Sunday the 14th of March, our second look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through to 23. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Last time we considered what it would take for other believers to constantly give thanks for us and remember us in their prayers, as Paul did for these Ephesian believers. We saw that there were two things that motivated his thanksgiving and prayer for them. Firstly, their faith, and secondly, their love for all the saints. Both of those things are found in verse 15. So we took a, a very brief look at the kind of faith that pleases the Lord Jesus and the kind of love for all the saints that pleases the Heavenly Father. So the faith, uh, just very three quick examples. Uh, we saw God loves faith that holds nothing back, but trusts him for everything. The example was the widow with her two mites and how she gave them both those coins because she knew that God was able to provide even though she gave him everything. So that's faith that holds nothing back. Secondly, we, we saw that God loves faith that motivates us to bring our friends to Jesus. And we saw those four friends carrying their paralytic friend, overcoming obstacles, not being put off by the things that were in their way because they knew that Jesus could heal their friends. So God loves faith that motivates us to overcome obstacles to bring our friends to him. And then we saw faith uh, that, that recognised and submitted to Jesus' authority in the form of the Roman centurion who desired that his servant be healed, but he, he wouldn't trouble Jesus so much as to ask him to come to his house. He just knew that all that had to happen was Jesus would issue the command and his servant would be healed. So faith that trusts God for everything, faith that motivates us to bring our friends to Jesus, and faith that recognises and submits and trusts Jesus' authority. Then the three forms of love that we considered. Firstly, Joseph loving and forgiving his brothers instead of giving them what they deserve. We saw Joseph looking at the whole situation, not through the eyes of a brother who'd been wronged, but through the eyes of faith to understand God's plan and purpose, even through the evil actions of his brothers, in order to put Joseph in the place to provide for them and to protect them. So that was the love that he extended to them. By seeing things through God's eyes, he loved his uh, terrible brothers and he provided for them and protected for them. We saw Ruth, instead of uh, giving up on her bitter old mother-in-law, Naomi, she loved her. She loved her God, she loved her people and she made that commitment to stick with Naomi right to the bitter end if needs be. That was love that she had for her because of the love that she had for Naomi's God. And then we saw that uh, uh, in the New Testament, those early believers loving the Lord Jesus, just wanting to know more about him, to spend time learning about him in prayer to him, and loving each other, living out his commandment to love one another through being close to each other, meeting one another's needs, enjoying spending time together. And the world looking on was so moved, so affected by the power of this real love that was on display that they wanted to know more. And so the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So three kinds of love then. Love that forgives instead of looks for vengeance. Uh, love that, that sticks uh, with, with the person right to the end and love that loves the Lord Jesus and loves one another so much that people look on and want to know for themselves. So that was the, the very brief recap of last time and you can look at the video on the YouTube channel or on the Northwood Chapel Facebook page if you want more uh, information. Now we're going to just move on and consider 
how and what Paul prayed for these believers. You see, if we're going to pray for somebody regularly, it would be helpful to know how we should pray for them and what we should pray for them. If you've just got a list of names that you pray through, going, God bless such and such, God bless such and such, and so on, it's not going to be a very rewarding or fulfilling prayer life, and you'll probably quite quickly get bored with it. And even if you continue with it, it'll be just like an automated process of running down a list of names. It won't have any real interactivity. There won't be any powerful prayer. So we're going to consider just exactly how Paul prayed for these believers and what he prayed for them. The how of it is simply this. He says in verse 16, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, Paul is not constantly in prayer for these believers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's not saying that, no. Uh, we know he can't possibly be praying for them every minute of every day because he's also busy praying for other churches too. And there are plenty of examples of that. Uh, in Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayers with joy. When he's writing to the Colossians in Colossians 1, 3, we always thank the God and Father of our Lord Jesus when we pray for you. And then uh, when he writes to the Thessalonians, we give thanks to God for all of you, mention you in our prayers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 2. So Paul is busy praying for everyone everywhere. He's not claiming that he's only praying for these Ephesian believers every minute of every day. He's simply letting them know he's continuing to pray for them. He has not stopped praying for them. They didn't briefly pop into his mind, make it to the top of his prayer list for a week or two, uh, and then just got relegated to the pray for an emergencies only list. No, they are part of his regular prayer routine. Whether that's a daily routine, which I suspect it could well have been, or whether it was weekly or monthly, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, does it? But what we do know is that he kept praying for them. They were part of his regular prayer pattern, along with many other churches and believers. And that tells us something very important about prayer from Paul's example. Paul must know that prayer matters and that prayer must work. You see, he was a very busy man. He got so many demands on his time, traveling, preaching, uh, discipling young churches, uh, planting uh, and growing churches uh, when he was not in prison, that is. So if Paul would give a substantial portion of his time and energy to prayer, he must have been convinced that it was worthwhile. He must have been sure that he was honoring God by giving his time and energy to praying for these individuals and these churches. And it is something that he is so passionately convinced about that he encourages other believers to pray likewise. Um, towards the end of this letter, Ephesians, uh, in that famous passage concerning putting on the whole armour of God, so the Christian soldier ready for Christian warfare by putting on that spiritual armour that God provides. But, but if you just stop with the last piece of, of, of armour, as it were, you, you'll miss out a very important part because as we get through chapter 6, at the end of it, we've got the armour that starts in verse 10, reading through there. But when we finished, we've got the, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, in verse 17. But then look in verse 18, he says, Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints, and also for me, that my words may be given to me an open mouth to boldly proclaim the ministry of the gospel. So what Paul is saying is once you've got all your armour on, ready for battle, the next step is to proceed through prayer. So prayer for the Christian soldier, it's sort of like the, the comms link and the power source for Christian battle. So a Christian who's equipped with the whole armour of God, who doesn't pray, they're effectively cut off. They're out of the loop, there's no communication going on, and they don't have the power given through prayer and so that they're, they're, they're in the dark and they're weak so prayer really matters to Paul and to us it is worth investing time and energy and and being in the habit of praying for people and for churches regularly so please don't reserve prayer for emergencies only get used to praying for one another in every circumstance of life not just in the disasters or crises so that's the how of Paul's prayer, to pray regularly. Now let's look at the what of prayer, 
that he uses for these Ephesians. Now, we've talked about how to pray for each other before and how to find out what needs praying for. And um, just to quickly recap, you know, we should be in contact with each other, shouldn't we? And there's no lack of opportunities to do that, even in lockdown times. Now, perhaps the closest you can get to somebody at the moment is a, a coffee on a bench, but it won't be too long before it's a, a drink in the garden or something like that and so on. But, but for now, we still have the telephone, we have texts, we have all kinds of social media. There are plenty of opportunities to be in touch with each other and to find out what's happening in one another's lives so that we can pray for the practical things uh, intelligently and just knowing what somebody does need in their lives. It, it's a real motivation to pray if we actually love one another, as Jesus said, but you have to find out those things in the first place. So we've covered that before. I won't go into too much. So do keep in touch, find out what things are happening in each other's lives. But what Paul majors on here, that's what I want us to give the bulk of our energy to considering today, because he doesn't just pray for the practical for them. He prays for the spiritual. Look at what he asks for here in chapter 1 and verse 17. He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So Paul is praying that God will give them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And in my Bible, spirit there is capitalised, just to help me understand, he's referring to the Holy Spirit. So Paul is writing to these believers and telling that he prays for them to have the Holy Spirit. But hang on a minute, just back in verse 13, he said, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So we've already considered in our journey through this letter so far that all believers are indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. It's impossible to be a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, a true follower of his, without being born again. And you can only be born again through the work of the Holy Spirit, who brings us alive in Christ and then indwells our body, uh, uh, making our body the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you're either a believer and you have the Holy Spirit, or you're not a believer and you don't have the Holy Spirit. It's as simple as that. So why should Paul apparently pray for these believers that God would give them the spirit of revelation and of knowledge in him? Why pray for them to have the Holy Spirit when he's already told them they have the Holy Spirit because they're believers? Well, what it is is that every believer indeed has the Holy Spirit. But does every believer have everything the Holy Spirit has to offer? Does every believer demonstrate that they're filled with the Holy Spirit by that abundant display of the fruit of Spirit in their lives? Sadly, that's not the case, is it? I'm sure you will have witnessed believers who show more or less of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Some are so full of the Holy Spirit that it's a an absolute delight to spend time with them. And, and when you come away, you almost feel like you've spent some time with Jesus. And yet other believers, somehow it's not that experience, is it? They, they almost leave us a little cold. They agree with the things about Jesus that we know and believe, but actually there's very little in their life and witness that shouts loudly of the Lord Jesus. Now, it is impossible to have more or less of the Holy Spirit but you can be more or less affected by his indwelling. You can have more or less fruit of the Holy Spirit, and you can be more or less like the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore show more or less of Jesus to the world around you. And what Paul wants for these believers is more. In some ways, that's kind of worldly idea, isn't it? Everybody wants more. But Paul wants more of a very good thing for these believers. He wants them to have more of the Holy Spirit's influence and authority and power in their lives. He wants the Holy Spirit to shape the way they think, the way they speak, the way they act, and even to mould the things that they love. 
to get a better idea of exactly what it is he wants for these believers, we can take a sneak preview at a passage uh, a bit later on in the same letter, into chapter 3. I'm just going to read you a couple of parts of verse 17 and 19. He prays, uh, telling them what he's praying for them. He says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, in verse 17, then out to verse 19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Filled with all the fullness of God. Mighty powerful words those, aren't they? And it made me think of the way that Paul describes the Lord Jesus when he was writing to the church at Colossae. In Colossians 1 verses 19 and chapter 2 and verse 9, he says, for in him, that's Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 and chapter 2 and verse 9. In other words, Paul writes to the Colossians, Jesus is as God as God can be. He is in no way less than God in any sense. He is absolutely 100% God. So what Paul is praying for these believers at Ephesus is not that they will become God because no created being can ever be God, but through knowing Jesus better, And knowing the Father better, they will become more like the Lord Jesus. He is praying for them the reality that he's already shared with the church at Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, it says this, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Remember Moses on the mountaintop when the Lord drew near to him. He he couldn't uh, allow Moses to see his face because no man may see God's face and live. But he could see God sort of from behind as he went past. And when Moses came down the mountain, because he'd been in such close proximity with God, his face was literally beaming radiantly with reflected light, the reflected glory of God, so much so that they put a veil over his face to hide it, didn't they? And and that's what Paul is saying, is that when we come close to Jesus, when we contemplate him, when we spend time with him, we absorb, as it were, his glory, and we beam gloriously and beautifully and radiantly because we've been close to Jesus And what Paul wants for these Ephesian believers is that they will actually become like Jesus by being close to him. And by the Holy Spirit's work in them, they will become ever more like Jesus. And that's what he's praying for them in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 1. He wants more of the Holy Spirit's work and influence in their lives so that they will be brought closer to Jesus and they will know more about Jesus, and their their whole demeanour and attitude and persona will will, will be more and more like Jesus. He, He doesn't want them to be half full of the Holy Spirit. You can't have half of the Holy Spirit or quarter of the Holy Spirit, but you can be half obedient or a quarter obedient. You can sometimes blow hot and sometimes blow cold. Paul doesn't want that for them or for us. God does not want that for us. He wants us to be fully in love with Jesus, close to Jesus, knowing more and more about him and becoming ever more like him. But why? Why does it matter if true followers of Jesus are like Jesus? Well, it matters for two reasons. Number one, it is our eternal destiny to be like Jesus. That work is in progress at the moment, which we just saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18. We all who with unveiled faces can contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. So that work is going on and one day it will be perfectly completed. As it says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3 verse 2. 
We won't be Jesus, but we will be like him. We will be free from sin's curse and we will be perfect just as he is perfect. That change is now in progress. It's not a just for there and then, although it's completed when we see Jesus. It happens now. And the more that we submit to the Holy Spirit, the more we allow him to, to guide us and to lead us, the more we, we demonstrate that mustard seed of faith that's been planted inside us, the more we, we love the Lord Jesus, the more we love his people, then the more that change becomes evident. And as I say, although that change won't be fully complete until the day we see him face to face, it can become so real now, so powerful, so convincing that others will begin to see that change in us too. And that brings us to the second reason. Yep, we should be changed because it is our destiny to be like Jesus, but here's the other reason too. And, and to understand it, listen to Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. Speaking to his disciples, he says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world, commissioned his disciples to shine brightly as witnesses for him, in effect making them the light of the world. But how can we persuade others to become followers of the Lord Jesus if we don't look anything like him, if we don't act anything like him, if we don't speak anything like him? So becoming like Jesus is an essential part of our effective witness. We can only shine brightly in the darkness if we look like the one who is the light of the world. And the more time we spend with Jesus, the closer we get to him, the more that we know of him, the more we will beam with his reflective glory, the more we will be like him, the more brightly we will shine in the darkness. Well, I'm actually going to keep it quite short this week and leave it there because next time I want to move on and consider the, the other things that Paul prays from the hope that they have in the Lord Jesus and the power that is available to them as they submit to his authority. But for today, let's just simply summarise what we've thought. So prayer, it's to be regular for one another and not just for emergencies. And we're to pray, not just for the practicalities, though, yeah, it's lovely and necessary to pray for those, but pray for the, the Holy Spirit's work in the heart of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, that, that they would learn more of him, draw close to him, submit to his power and authority, and, and that they would be transformed so that they will look so much like Jesus that the world around will want to know more and that the gospel witness will become powerful and effective because they look like the one they're leading others to. And while you're praying that for others, why don't you pray that somebody would be praying that for you too? That's our message today. God bless you.